welcome to the Space 4.0 building uh, space entrepreneurship ecosystem, the fuel for industry innovation. And what I learned as a startup, to be sharp and in time, because this is super important to deliver in time. My name is Frank Salzgeber. I'm heading the technology transfer and business incubation office. I uh, was working for Apple. I had my own startup company. And now I'm taking care of the startup support in ESA. But it's not about me, it's about the panel. And we have exciting three people here who want to share a little bit what we do, what we could do, listen to you. I have some surprises for you, some exercises, you know. Panel always have to work. They do not know yet what, and you can join them. For the introduction, I want to introduce first Kira Backwell. And uh, you're now executive in NASA. And I, when looking to a little bit your career, you're working in technology companies, you're advising strategic advisor partnership, working with startups, nonprofit organization. And now you help to fuel the innovation into NASA, I heard. Is that correct? That's correct. Take the mic. Take the mic. Yes, that's right. So what means that? I figured a nod would do. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, I started up a program called NASA iTech, where we look for cutting edge technologies that are solving problems on Earth that also can solve problems in space. We provide a platform for these technologies to present their technologies in front of investors, VCs, some of our contractors, and our chief technologists who evaluate it for its space application. And in the last nine months, those companies have been able to raise $48 million in nine months. Excellent. Pretty, pretty good numbers. Do we have investors here in the audience? So we also invest in seed, yes. We want investors there, very good. And so, OK, I think we have to work on that. What are they doing? Yeah, I don't know. Is there industry? Who is industry? Do you guys have jobs? Yeah, OK. Just kidding. Yeah. OK, you have jobs, three job, jobs here already. <laughs> agencies? Do we have agencies here? I think we have a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs, which okay. is great. Who wants to become people? entrepreneur? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> then you're in the right session. And sorry for the others which are not listening. Anyhow, the second person. Um, after that, I have to introduce my boss, Director General of ESA, Professor Jan Dietrich Werner. Um, Space 4.0 uh, is one of your teams. Uh, you had your own startup company next to, I think, your profession, 94, I have reading. In May 2017, Edo Rossi is the co founder and the executive of the Founder Institute announced, so this year, that by 2025, they want to support until 2025, 500 companies related to space and space exploration. You announced last week that ESA has already supported 500. So is Mr. Rossi too late? No, we are happy if there are many, many others to support. And if there is a competition who is supporting most, I'm just happy. I don't want to uh, have to be the, the first or the biggest. We are doing our job. And each and every company coming out of ESA with our support is nice. That's all. OK, so competition is good. Some lessons learned when you started the company in 94, because now I have to ask you as an entrepreneur. Again? That what was the lessons learned in 94 when you created the company? <sighs> Failure is not an option. No, failure ah. is just a data point. So uh, this is much better than failure is not an option. No, this company still exists. We modified it twice. Um, uh, and uh, I will not go into detail because this is unfortunately not an advertisement uh, uh, podium. Uh, the lesson I learned is really you have to take risk. You have to be ready for that. And sometimes you have also to be ready to to do some disruptive ideas, even if you do not know whether you will get money out of that the next day. So I would always uh, say, do what you like to do and where you really think you personally can put uh, the best power in it. If it's successful or not, of course, the market will decide. But if you do something just in order to make the market happy, you will be unhappy very soon. And therefore, this is not a good solution. I'll give you another uh, thing for that. Um, if you look, for, for instance, concerning the income, people are always believing the more income I have, the, the luckier I am. There is a serious investigation about income and how lucky or uh, how happy the people are. And the situation is this is not a, a linear extrapolation. The more money you earn personally, 
the happier you are. And this is a very important message. Now the curve goes like this, so it starts linearly. If you have no money, you are unhappy. Okay, if you get a little bit more, you are happier, you are happier. But then this curve got the curvature and goes more or less horizontally. So that means to get three times or four times of this value does not make you on a long term happier. Now the question is, where is this curve? And this is the interesting opinion. Now I will ask you, what do you think where it is? I will give you, let's say, um, four numbers. No, I will just ask you, do you think it's uh, below 150,000 US dollars per year or above. Who believes that this curve is, is flattening already below 150,000 uh, US dollars? What 140,000 below 140,000? Below 130,000? Below 120,000? Yearly income below 100? Okay, it is below 80,000, I can tell you. So that means the curve is at 80,000 uh, US dollars. So don't look for more money. This is my, rec my information. <laughs> look for, better, for a better job, for better products which make you happy. This is much better than just the money. By the way, I earn more than 80,000. <laughs> Titos, you like to hear that, that the companies which you invest do not want to have higher salaries. Is that correct? Um, well, be before getting to the companies, maybe I should just yes, say no, a little I'm bit about what we I do, just, just to give some context fine. before uh, I jump into the salaries and, and founders. Uh, so we're an early stage venture capital firm. We actually stay with our companies through the life cycle of their journey. So as an example, we were early investors in a company called Spire in 2012. And to this day, I still have monthly calls or meetings with Peter, the CEO. Our sweet spot is helping companies go global. And that's because that's a pain point that we found as entrepreneurs when we were building our global businesses. So myself and my, my two co-founders. And what we found was that there weren't many venture capital investors who had actually built cross-border businesses. And so we've got team members in Silicon Valley, Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, uh, Dubai, and as of this week, we just added India. So it's been uh, it's been a bit, it's been a nice week. And our portfolio is just over 50 companies worth 1.5 billion US. And our investors are not just financial; they also want something strategic and our partners. So with that context, back to the salaries and the entrepreneurs, we see a, a huge range. So I was I just had a meeting with one of our founders in Silicon Valley. He gives himself a, a zero salary, and he was saying. At what point should I start to pay myself? And as a VC, on the one hand, I'm super impressed that you know, he's been able to run the company like that. But at the same time, that's not sustainable. So we want him to pay himself a market salary. On the other extreme, one of our other Silicon Valley companies, there's a competitor trying to poach people for starting salaries of 400,000 US dollars for a mid-level engineer. right? And, and so you get all the extremes and when we look at it, it comes back to the fact that talent is the key to each startup and company. And I think Peter um, from Rocket Lab was talking about that. It's not the product, it's the people that are, are making the company. And so if you're running your company, you've got to figure out what you need to pay your employees, right? Whether it's through equity, whether it's through salary, and there's different solutions for different companies. Obviously, salaries in Estonia are different from salaries in Silicon Valley. I have the point of motivation, and I'm just looking for my first hero, and I, I lost his helmet, uh, so it's a little bit small, you can't see it, so I make it a little bit bigger. So that, that was my first hero when I was nine. Uh, it's, it's a leg astronaut, but uh, somewhere in my pocket I lost the helmet, so he's dying now at the moment, I'm sorry for him. So, and uh, when we speak about entrepreneurship, I hear a lot of about, it's about flexibility, it's about curiosity, like Jan always saying. What was your first hero? Mine? Yes. I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe nobody knows, but Old Shatterhand, this is a person from, uh, in a book from Karl May, which uh, was uh, in a Western. He never was in the United States, this uh, author. This was really a hero for me. But I will answer the question in a little bit different way, because dreams is something important. Um, there, uh, um, there was a, a race driver who was the head of the Ferrari 
uh, team. And I ask him, um, how do you select people for your team? And this is, comes close to the question what you're asking. And he said, yes, I ask them just, what is your motivation? Why to come to Ferrari? And if they say, it was my dream all the life to become a member of the Ferrari team, he does not take him or her. Because this is the same with a person, with a hero. If you just have the dream, I want to be an astronaut, it might be exactly the same, because the very next day, the dream is over. So, he's, it's done. He is a member of Ferrari. He is an astronaut if he flew. So, the, the danger is that the dream is fulfilled, and then you are in a boring phase. Um, maybe not that extreme case, but this is something, so if you have a dream just to be something, that's really dangerous. So this guy said, when the person is saying, I want to make Ferrari the fastest car in the world championship, then this is a dream which is really difficult to achieve, not on the first day, not on the second day, it's long lasting, and this is much better. So my recommendation would be not to have just a hero as a, as a dream, but to have something which is really driving you for longer time, to have a product, to have new ideas, and by the way, if I, have, if I say I just want to have the cheapest uh, mobile phone on the market, this is also gone afterwards. So it's better one dream to have already a second dream afterwards, and so on. So dream by dream by dream, you go into the future. So the, the question to the others, what drives you? what you do today? Because I think only making the maximum profit, it's nice, but then no, we're no, back to the question. No. In my case, it was, I was lucky with my, with my development. So the, the office, which I still have, this civil engineering office, we are always trying to, to, to try things which nobody tried before. For instance, we built the first uh, acrylic glass bridge. It was a failure, yes, because we got some cracks and some other people thought we have to, uh, to uh, demolish it. But for us, it was great. Now we are looking for the next type, uh, totally different material. As a person, as a person uh, I was lucky. I was uh, uh, president of a university. After several years, I got what I wanted to do, so I changed my dreams. I got the next position as the head of the German uh, Aerospace Center. I stayed there for another eight years. Um, uh, and then, okay, I looked for the next one, and now I'm uh, in my final round, round close for departing, I mean, in my age. <laughs> but if you have another dream for me, I will dream it. Okay. Kira, when, because bringing startups to, to NASA, I think you have to be as passionate, uh, and we discussed it yesterday, yesterday, stubborn is not the right word, I uh, heard, but they're nicer words. Tenacious. 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 And uh, uh, because I think this is also a typical synonym for startup companies. Absolutely. And so the question is, how do I survive every day? For example, because you are spending the same midnight oil as the startups, I guess. I am. I probably work 60 to 70 hours a week at least. Um, but it goes back to what drives me. I love what I do. And I gave this example to you last night when we were kind of talking about things. I was flying home from a trip in California, and I'm sitting next to an eight-year-old, and I have my laptop up, and I've been typing. And she kind of leans over and says, you've been working a long time. Where do you work? Or what do you do? Or something like that. And I said, well, I work for NASA. And she said, wow, one day, that's what I want to do. My, that's my dream job at eight years old. This eight-year-old wants to work for NASA. I said, well, what would you like to do for NASA? And I thought she'd say astronaut, but instead she said, I want to build robots someday for, for NASA. And so if you notice, most of us at NASA wear a NASA pin. Um, when you, if you're from NASA, well, at least at headquarters, you actually have to swear in when you receive your pin. It's sort of this official kind of ceremony, and so I take my pin off, and I pin it on the eight-year-old girl, and I said, you know, the fact that you're wanting to do this at eight is great, but the journey that you've chosen is going to be hard, 
and there's going to be days that you want to give up and quit. And so when you decide you want to give up and quit, I want you to look back at this little pin, which is the NASA meatball, so that it inspires you to not give up so that you can pursue that dream. At the end of the day, when I look back and I go, why do I do what I do? It's because of eight-year-old little girls like that who've decided that that's their dream or that's their passion. It's because of the entrepreneurs at 22, year, 22 years old that are developing medical devices so that they can save lives, so that they can change the world. And so for me, if I can take the NASA meatball that is, inspires people across the globe to pursue their dreams, to, that inspires them to dream bigger dreams, to, to tackle the impossible, if I can do, help the entrepreneurs to develop those technologies to help us get to where we need to be, if I can use it as a platform to help them raise $48 million in nine months, then it's why I get up every morning. Titus, is that the same? Oh yeah, you may applaud, that's fine. <laughs> Investing in space, you need the same passion because it's not a return after two years, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting. You'd think that as a private sector VC, I might have a very different view, right, to be focused more on, on the numbers. And while the numbers are important and, and those are the, the minimum stakes to get involved as an investor in a company, ultimately when we think of our business, our big mission is what we call building global ecosystems. And so you can't get any more abstract than that. Um, when we think about space and, and the opportunity here, you know, I was giving this talk uh, over the weekend to some of the members of parliament and what I emphasized was that we need to bring space down to earth. And it was similarly for my daughter. So the example I used was that my daughter right now is an email expert. For her birthday at age seven, she asked her brother for a Gmail account. And she's obviously an expert in, in apps. And the internet and the ecosystem and the startups around the internet have really honed in on that customer discovery and user experience so that even my seven-year-old daughter is an expert. When you think about space as an industry, there's a big gap, right? The, you know, forget about seven-year-old kids just trying to figure out whether anyone can get access to space and space technology and applications is, is a big barrier. So for us to tie that back to our approach, we're investors in some infrastructure companies in space, but what we're really excited about is then the applications on top of that. And I, and I heard some of the panelists talking earlier today, some of the entrepreneurs, about that value chain, right? Building up, first of all, the infrastructure, then the applications. We do think it's early, but when you think back 20 years ago or 30 years ago to people involved in the internet, the entrepreneurs, the VCs, it lasted 20 to 30 years of benefit. And so I would say that whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a VC investor, whether you're a government, a country, now is the time to be unleashing this private sector innovation and entrepreneurship. Because when I look back in 30 years and then my daughter is 37, I want to be able to say, yeah, I had that little bit that we made that little dent in this story. And so that's what motivates me. Is that why, the, why agencies should support entrepreneurship and startups? Because in the industry panel before, we say, yeah, I leave it to industry. But I, I see industry is not doing it, eh, to be frank. So it's not that the reason why the agency help. The, the Irish have a very nice saying, on the shoulders of the giants, you say further. Are you the giants? The, the problem, if I'm, I'm just going to jump right in, the problem is, is it's both. Okay, it's not one or the other. We are able to leverage the history that NASA brings to the table, right? But we don't have all the funding in the world to develop every technology that we're going to need. And there's companies out there that are already developing technologies that we know we'll need for the future. And so if we can somehow connect those dots bring the entrepreneurs in with potentially the, the private sector to help them further develop it or bring them in so that we can help them understand requirements and what they're going to need early on, then I think that 
we'll be able to do it together. And I know that you're going to jump in on this whole together thing because I know it's a big thing for you, but it's true. We can't do it by ourselves. And I know that. And But I also know that there's other people out there that are already doing it. And so it's not either or, it's and. It's. Yeah, I would like to add uh, one point. So you were talking about the value chain which is fine. I would like to talk about the innovation chain, which is not getting financial values permanently, but if you look from very fundamental research, the chain from fundamental research to applied research to product development, finally to products. This is the innovation chain which leads from inno invention to innovation. And I see that the agency have, uh, agencies have a very special task in that, especially to always to fertilize this process uh, to have also new ideas coming in a in an low uh, technology readiness level where still you cannot directly make money out of it. I give you an example. My beloved example is Albert Einstein. If you look to Albert Einstein and uh, his theory of relativity, uh, he has uh, written the theory of relativity of uh, uh, general, uh, uh, general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity. And according to these two Series, um, time is dependent on gravity and uh, velocity. Okay, for decades, this was just something without any value. Huh? It was for scientists and I think to, to have. A typical agency action would be for me to support even those type of developments also in the very early phase. But then don't forget about it, but have some knowledge management to keep the, the knowledge available. And it, it took decades until this theory of relativity came to a real value. And then it comes also to companies. In this case, it was the navigation system. Uh, satellite navigation, without knowing that time is dependent on gravity and time is dependent on velocity, the clocks on board of, uh, of uh, navigation satellites would give signals which lead to an error of about 500 meter in one hour would be without any value. So therefore, I think the agencies have, have the task to feed in new ideas, to make some cross fertilization possible, so to have access to all the results and technologies. Therefore, ESA decided also to have a total open technology and data uh, policy. And then we are, can also support with some funding, if necessary, here and there, uh, some companies, but what I learned from the young entrepreneurs, they are not looking first to get some seed money. In our case, they are asking more to have access to the technology. This is inter was interesting for me. Of course, they are happy if they get some funding, but the funding cannot be the basis for the whole company. I mean, then they are running out of the money after some time. So the, it sh should be just the seed money, and it should be technology available, and uh, maybe also consultation possible in the, in the agency. And the branding you said yesterday. Yes. Yes, the branding is important. Um, I would say that pretty much any country I go to, I could wear the NASA meatball, and it's recognizable. And that's... Oh, there is a one, you know, so it's nearly the same. Uh, well, I don't work for ESA, <laughs> so I'm just, yet. <laughs> I'm just giving the NASA example. Okay. But I know that it's, that it's true that the example I gave you with the eight-year-old, I mean, I took the pin off, and when I gave it to her, she began to tear up as I pinned it on her, and I began to tear up. But, it, but that, it, it inspires people. To, to dream bigger dreams. And, and it's amazing to me that all you have to do is, sh is show the meatball and that, that branding carries a lot of weight. I have a small exercise for you because uh, uh, no contest where you not can win a t-shirt, it's a t-shirt like me, you don't get it in ESA, you have to do an invention or working, BDGG of course, or working in my team. Yeah? So I have one t-shirt with me, you can win, you know? It'd be, I'm an engineer and I'm testing your know, engineering capabilities. You also get a piece of paper each if you hand it over. And there, can you help me to hand out a piece of paper here? Because you, you have to build something. You have less than a minute. I get the t-shirt in the meantime. So, and I want to, any construction, and the way is you have to throw, fly the furthest. So the distance counts. And I just get the t-shirt, not that I 
So it's, it's packed, you know, you have to wash it before. So I didn't word it. It's an L. So even I have an M, so it was a. So and I'm looking, it should be super quick, you know, and then I say stop. So I count to 10. Go You're quick, go, start, 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 start. You'll get less than a minute. As fast as yes, the, the as distance counts. The only thing was the distance. Any construction is allowed. Distance. Have everybody a piece of paper? Copy is totally allowed, yeah? OK. Who knows the test? Don't do it. Come on, quicker, 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 quicker. We have speed up the time of the pr big primes before. OK. I want to get rid of that. Is everybody ready? Yes. Huh? I have to no. Yeah? I, I count to 10, and then everybody stops. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So stop. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. So who's starting? The audience starts. Okay. One, two, three. Yeah, throw. You both throw. Okay. Very good. Okay, good. So you saw some people. The ball. You know what the people say when I do with the Zoom? They're cheating. Huh? So you don't get t-shirts because you're the, not in the audience. So, so who was the fastest in the audience? Yeah? Huh? No, no. What's, who was the fastest? There? Who was the fastest? Yeah? So you? No. There. Burn that was the topper. The pink. You come to me. Here's the t-shirt. Huh? Yeah, who was the fastest was there? I saw that. Just huh? know if you get the yes. t-shirt, you yes. have to have an invention at ESA. Yes, and, and I expect the invention for ESA. So it's just a credit, my friend. Huh? It's just a credit. Write down his name and address, please. So, so OK. And I copy that and because I want to speak. Uh, by the way, which line is longer? No, I changed it yesterday night. And this is what we want to discuss um, about the business model. So, which is changing. What is the new business model of space? Who wants to start? Uh, we go with I, the VCs. I guess since I'm a VC, that's, that's probably um, something you know, I've been thinking a lot about. So, let's start with the large corporates, right? Because there's been a lot of this debate about what, what large companies should do, how they can avoid disruption and all this great stuff. So, I don't think you have to reinvent everything. You can look back into history and look at some successful case studies. I think there's a few... Uh, uh, let's say waves. So wave one, I would look at Cisco in the late 1990s, where they owned the customer channel for internet infrastructure and bought startups for the innovation, for the technology, sometimes paying billions of dollars for zero revenue companies and scaled those businesses successfully. It was a beautiful model as, as long as you were building internet infrastructure. It didn't work so well once the demand shifted to applications, right? Then the next versions were Google and Facebook. I think Google's best acquisition was Android. You think about what Android has done from an ecosystem perspective. It was a fantastic purchase. Not really direct monetization, right? Strategic. Facebook bought WhatsApp for 19 billion US dollars. Again, a zero revenue business effectively, but brilliant. And so when you think about the engineering talent that Facebook had, that Google had, they still went out and bought companies. I think the key lesson there is they didn't have a disease. They didn't have a disease called not invented here. If they found a technology outside of their company that was successful, they could pay 19 billion US dollars, and it was correct. Is that the uh, advice for the agencies? Well, so, the so okay, let's, let's, move, let's move one step forward. There's, there's a third model. So you say, OK, well, this is all great for the internet, but what does it have to do with space? Because right? space is different. So there's this little company out of Japan called SoftBank. SoftBank has a $100 billion fund. Even for space, that's a decent chunk of change. They've identified the space industry as strategic. And so you might say, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll just let them give up. They're not going to give up. They're going to keep going. So at the very least, you've got one serious player with deep pockets that is going to be aggressively acquiring and trying to disrupt things. But I think there's actually going to be more players. 
So what you need as a large corporate is you need to have a top tier M&A team. So I don't mean the traditional M&A where you run the spreadsheets. You have to actually understand the, the things beyond that, the team and, and so forth. Um, then the second thing is you have to build relationships with VCs and startups. You have to have tools for those relationships. So if you're doing it on emails and spreadsheets, you're probably doing it wrong. So you really have to invest in technology infrastructure and human capital to engage with the ecosystem. And then you have a chance for your business model. Then if you flip it around for the startups, if you're a startup, you know, we heard earlier, you have to make things customers want. Well, how do you do that? What are, what are some of the, the tricks and, and challenges? So I'll give you an example of one of our companies, Kite. They actually make this product for large companies to engage with startups and ecosystems. OK, what is the new business model for space? One sentence. Right. So you've got to have your niche as a startup and know why it's different. Okay. That's, the, that's the number one key as a startup. Good. Kira? So the new business model for space, it has to be quick. We can't go at a government pace. Okay. You have to be agile. And you have to be able to leverage dollars outside of the government agencies and, and not depend on solely government contracts to develop the technologies, as well as leveraging existing technologies that are being developed for dual purposes that can be developed for Earth and space. I truly think that those elements are critical to the new business model for space. Jan? I see two new methods uh, which we can have in the future. I mean, we have all of this PPP and all, uh, all this stuff, which gives already possibilities to have new space technologies or uh, something developed. I see the possibility for two things. One I call open concept. Open concept means that there are different entities, private and public, bringing together their ideas to do something which they cannot do alone. Uh, I always uh, explain that with the example of the Moon Village, but you can have it also in general terms, meaning that there is not, not a direct link, an institutional link between the different uh, actors, but that each and every actor, private or public, brings his special competence, a niche, for instance, into an overarching open concept. This is number one. And the second one, I have no better word than a shareholder project, meaning you, you have an equity manager, which could be the space agency, but could be also a private entity, and saying, now we do this project and we, we sell the shares of that project. Um, then the question is whether it must be shares which always lead to return of investment on financial basis or also societal basis. So this is another point. But so I see these two new types of uh, possibilities of businesses where companies and space agencies can work, could work together. Here you had a comment. I was going to add one comment. Um, what I've found in the U.S. in working with other government agencies and having these conversations with DOD, um, obviously being with being in NASA, is that the intellectual property is important for the entrepreneurs to be able to hold on to if they are going to further develop the technology and if there's an expectation for them to be able to get investments in the future, then it can't be government owned. And that's not apparently an issue that ESA has, no, but it is, it is an issue in the US government and not just for NASA, it's across the government agencies. And so for us, that model needs to change. So the IPR... I can, just yes. if you allow me, I can give you one example of my past as being the head of the German Aerospace Center, which was also doing, or which is still doing uh, energy and transport and so on. And there was an invention of a new brake for cars. And of course, with intellectual property rights. Everything was fine, and then a company, a big company, bought the, the rights. Brembo. And they never built that brake because it was not necessary, because they had a product, so they, it was not uh, necessary for them. And this was, for me, a clear message. Never sell IPRs exclusively if you have them. You, you should keep it open for other companies. This makes the competition. Um, so ESA has a different, uh, different policy, but this was one lesson I learned by that. 
I jump over the next three slides because we started later, and I promised at least the audience uh, that we do something fun too uh, with, with our um, group. And one of the things, I need the sound, you know, because you have now to tell me what is the image. There was a TV show in the 80s. Uh, the Germans maybe know it. Can we have the sound? And you see always a slide of the picture. You know, you get nothing yeah, for that. You get only points. And, um, and the, what the last can we one, do with the points? Yeah, yeah. You see, you exchange it with me <laughs> with free T-shirts, uh, brownie, oh. brownie points. You know, brownie points. You're not doing an ICO. Use. So let me see. Dali, dali. Okay, it's not Star Wars. It's at Lasers in Chile. You know? Okay, yeah. fine. You were there, you should know it, so that was an advantage to you. But no, it was cloudy on that day. Okay. And that is the reason whenever Tim Dezu, the former director general, asked me, will you come again to Chile? I said, no, it's always cloudy over yeah. there. I was only one day there, and it was cloudy, and he's still disappointed because I tell everybody it's always cloudy in Chile, whenever I'm there. That was nasty, I know. It's, or you had or it could have been the alcohol, I don't know. Yes, I know. It, it, it's the altitude, it's the altitude. <laughs> okay, another one which is more easy because there's really a space relation. It's a, it has to do with a TV show out of Britain in the 70s. Red Dwarf? It was Space 99. This was the people thought 75 Space 99 would look like. And I saw this very similar to what we're discussing mm. here when you're looking at the moon village. Right? Mm. Okay, sorry, I keep my brownie points. Yes, Thank we don't get much. brownie points. I'm looking a little bit to the watch. Um, I, I have more questions. I had more, much more questions, but we're running out of time for several reasons. But uh, looking to that, I want that you think about that very short like Luxembourg, each of you get 200 million, and you would have to invest in space-related entrepreneurship. What would you do? I would do a competition, and I would not put 200 million directly on the table. I would separate, let's say, uh, 50, and then going down so that I have more than just one award. Okay. Pity, I thought he said, I give it to you, Frank, but I failed, that's fine. Uh, you got it anyhow, so why should I do it <laughs> so this way? Just kidding. Okay. Kira, but maybe. For, for. I would take the 200 million and invest in the various companies that have been a part of iTech because they're pretty stellar. Would you take shares? Um, would I take share? Would I take. Shares negotiate? of the companies? Well, if I was a VC and investing, of yes. course. But yes. see, the government owns it all. A VC, you get to negotiate with. Okay. So, yes. Titus. Well, since there's no return objective here, I take the 200 million and invest it in education. I think the ROI of training the next generation of talent. Investing for space-related entrepreneurship. We yeah, want, okay, in, in education for space-related entrepreneurship and talent. He'd start the a space-related entrepreneurship insane. program. Yes, and he's Let a VC. Yeah? This gives applause for a VC. These kind of VCs we need. <laughs> yes, Trust me, the engineers normally say, cool, I built a rocket. You know, but this is, I think, what the answer we'd like. Um, we're coming to the end. Um, if you have to complete the sentences, and I take this one for Jan first. In 20 years, space will be, and I will still. In 20 years, space will be the basis for future, for the future. And I will still <laughs> be close to death. <laughs> Okay, nothing changes, that's good. Uh, we will tease you, no, we don't tease you. Um, startups will, Kira? Startups will continue to be a part of our society. There will continue, there, I, I feel like there will always be startup companies developing the next big thing. Titus. The majority of space funds will be run by Fresco Capital. Yeah. <laughs> we said we will run over 10 minutes, so I have still two or three minutes. Question from the audience. That's now your chance. 
Otherwise, I have 15 other questions, but they are boring. They were for the beginning. Anything you want to ask this panel, now it's your chance. Come on. Yes, please, sir. Can we have a mic there? Or uh, otherwise, a run down there? Yes, uh, run. yes, we take. I run, you know. This, we are multi purpose in ESA. Here we go. Frank? Sir. Yeah, can um, you take both. What, what you do and what is your name? Oh, the whole thing. All right. Yeah, sure. Frank Robert, AD Kearney Consulting. Um, so, working with some private equity funds that are looking to move more into entrepreneurial uh, and with some venture startups. And that's the, the genesis of the question uh, is if you have a startup, uh, which uh, I can give examples, but one that uh, has a long-term objective that's very pie in the sky because the missions that it would be supporting will not happen until probably the 2030s, so they have to have a short-term objective so that they can survive until then. How do you evaluate such a thing? I mean, you, you probably, the discount rate would say you just ignore the, the part that is in the long term. Uh, but if you're investing in education, maybe you would invest. So in the question goes to Titos, I guess, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think Elon Musk is a great example, right? He's, he's got this long-term vision, but he's got tangible things that he's doing today. And I think that's the sign of a great entrepreneur, which is dream big, but do it step by step. You want to answer? Mm. No? OK, good. <laughs> I would say the same. You know, this is, of course, you have to think long-term. One of the clients of ESA is the Catholic Church. We also do business with them. They see long-term, trust me. But uh, not everybody has that long-term uh, focus than uh, the Vatican. Uh, nevertheless, I think you have to drop something out. I think this is the, the best example. Or identify another business model that you can add to that existing technology where it can generate revenue. One last question. Otherwise, I would close. Your chance. He was giving back the mic. He's a consultant. Huh? The, okay. Okay. If you can say your name and what you're doing. Yep, um, I'm Tim Cruikshank. I'm from uh, Us2, a product design studio. Um, so my question is, how do we get uh, the big agencies and big corporates to uh, acknowledge or respect human-centered design in space industry? Human-centric human design. Yeah, that. like... Um, Product design, you were from Apple, right? You would have understood a lot about human-centered design. Yeah, I think on the ISS, if you go to the Russian segment, they have already different colors, walls. And so <laughs> There's a start, you know, they have a table. So that our astronaut, whatever we do, is not only pure technology, that it's also looking good, nice, touchable. That's what you mean? Uh, design for human need is probably a better way. Maybe. So what do you mean in terms of respect? <clears throat> I feel like at the moment it's a pretty uh, lacking uh, mindset in the space industry from what I've observed so far. Um, I, I'm keen to get into the space industry and I come from an industry that is entirely focused around human-centered design. Um, and I want to see how it plays in the industry. Have you ever seen the architecture of the Russian modules um, f starting from Soyuz, Vostok, also Mir? An architect, a female architect, uh, Galeshova or something like that was her name, uh, she designed all of this exactly what you are saying. So I don't think that we are not human centric, of course. We are uh, with, a, with a spacecraft, um, if you mean that, uh, we are first looking to the function. But all of this has to be uh, fitting uh, also to uh, the humans inside, the seats, uh, the, how, the, how to maneuver, etc. Um, I don't see that there is really that big uh, lack of activity. So I would probably say as an entrepreneur, if you're developing something and you feel like that you're having a hard time breaking into the industry, uh, you just honestly, if it's solving a problem for the industry, go to www nasaitech.com and it's an open solicitation, a five page white paper and if it does solve one of our problems and it's considered a priority for the agency, it'll make it to the top 10 and you'll have a whole bunch of people to present it to. So 
at least from our perspective, and I know that you guys reach out to entrepreneurs, ESA reaches out to entrepreneurs as well. So there are platforms for you to do, for you to present your technology. It just has to solve a problem for, for the agency. It has, for, for us, it also has to solve a problem here on Earth. So it can't be just space related. It has to also solve a problem for somebody else other than NASA. But it's a, for me, I went, I went through and designed a program that would be simple, that would be, um, you know, I would take out all the red tape so that entrepreneurs didn't have the challenges because I realized they could go somewhere else to try and take their technology. But the reality is I know we need them as much as they need us. And so I designed something to make it simple for them so that they would want to be a part of it. And granted, it's, we presented our first uh, 10 companies nine months ago, but word probably hasn't got out well enough, but I know that there's ways in which you can do that. I close here, thank you very much. The panel should get a great applause. Thank you for being here because that's super important, space entrepreneurship. And if you reach out to us, also I have to do some advertisement, just let us know. Thank you very much for your attention.